His love for me never runs out. Come taste and see that the Lord is good. He is good. Come now, drink and be satisfied. Forgiveness, oh. has taken me on a journey ever since I was little. He's done amazing things most recently and um, I think that's my heart is just to share that with people. Yeah, I grew up in a conservative Christian home and since I can remember I've always been a Christian. My mom and dad met, they weren't believers and just through the process of my mom having me and my sister stirred her heart to ask about God. Well, we actually used to ask, Mom, where does, where does God live? Does he wear pajamas? Does he eat ice cream? Just kiddie questions that my mom couldn't answer because she didn't, she didn't know what the answer was. And yeah, I'm just grateful that she has been a strong pillar of strength and faith in my, in my walk with the Lord. She's the one who introduced me to God. Most recently, in the last couple of years, there's been like an awakening um, to, to new things, getting to know Father God as a father and, and somebody as a person. Dave and I got married 10 years ago and um, we've been questioning a lot of things and um, it's just amazing how the Lord works in that questioning process. Things happen and He turns those happenings into good, evil things into good for those who love Him. On the 18th of August, um, 2014, um, Satan used a man to break into our home. We were um, asleep in our beds late at night. It must have been around 12 o'clock. We were on the farm. My first memory was something was in our room hovering over Dave. And I just remember trying to get him off him. And then there was just darkness. I was now at the bottom of the bed. I was trying to say things and my, my, my words were slurring out and I looked slightly, I was on all fours and I looked slightly to my left and there were these feet and then I was like, you know, what's, what's happening? And he, as I was trying to stand, he lifted me and he was saying, be quiet, otherwise I'll beat you, be quiet. And in that process, he tied my hands up behind my back with wire and as, as he did that, I, I looked across over to the bed where Dave lay and all I remember is just him lying on his back with um, just blood everywhere, blood on the walls, blood on the pillows and I just remember his face like almost being flat, like featureless and just blood and I could hear him kind of uh, grunting and like gurgling and then I thought wow this is bigger than I thought thought. Um, but it was just amazing how even though it was such a horrendous sight and, and an experience, it was just God was there and I could feel his peace. It was surreal. And yeah, that's just the grace of God in a situation like that. And the guy who was in our room was demanding money. He wanted money. And I by that stage, I didn't realize that I'd been hit on my head. So when I woke up in the dark, that's when he hit me. And then I got knocked out. And so also I didn't realize that I had a compound fracture on my ring finger. So I was, that's why I had a hairline fracture uh, to my skull. So I also was just a bit disorientated. And, and I was trying to remember where the safe keys were. And Dave, being Dave, he would change the hiding spot. And now I'm frantically looking for these keys and I take the guy with my hands behind my back and I walk him to Dave's desk He's, and I'm nodding to where he should look and it's not there and I'm just getting a little bit nervous as to he's now thinking that I'm hiding the key from him. I then realized, okay, it's behind the picture above the bed and it was. So he got into the safe and he's like, that's not enough. 
he then led me to the dining room where I, I said to him, there's a petty cash, there's a cash box there, let's go look there. And he walked me there and there were just a few dollar, dollar bills. He was like, no, this is not enough. So he, he then marched me to the lounge where um, he pushed me backwards onto the couch and my hands were still tied behind my back and he started to... Um, He started to pull at my underwear and then I was like this is probably a woman's worst nightmare and I just remember kicking him like just using my feet to kick him and he had a knob carry in his hand and he was beating my, my knees and my legs and I just remember shouting Jesus Jesus name out of at, at him and it was only later on I realized that Jesus came. He came and he was there and he's been there since and he's been the most loving, mo most merciful, most gracious and good, good person to me. And so that was kind of like the start of this journey with Jesus. I called his name and he came and that's just how he is. And he's intending, he's beating her, intending to rape her what changes his course of action what, what how did that change without god anyway that that was also the start of like a spiritual journey for me in the sense that spiritual warfare like there was there was something happening in the spiritual realm over us and the authority of jesus name is just awesome and instantly the guy changed and he walked, marched me to, to my bedroom. And by that stage I was quite um, exhausted. I didn't realize my injuries. And I, I just remember, I thought I was sweating because there was just trickles just coming down my face. And it was actually blood. And for some reason he kept walking in and out, in and out of the bedroom. So I just sat on the edge of my bed and I remember Haley, my eldest, who was five years at the time, our youngest was three years old, and I remember Haley getting out of bed. I didn't see her, but I could hear her patter patters of her footsteps, and I just shouted at her and I said, "Get in your bed and stay there." And he kind of like mock charged, chasing her down the corridor, and then I kind of moved towards the end of my side of the bed, and I was just like, "I need to do something. I can't leave my family like this." And he kept saying to me, I'm going to bring more war vets. I'm going to bring more war vets. And um, I was just thinking, if I'm like this, and he's going to bring more guys, what else can happen? It was just, I didn't want to think about it. So with my hands tied up behind my back, very tight, I kind of managed to get my phone and dial with a broken ring finger, blood ev everywhere, little did I know hands tied behind my back and a touchscreen phone. Our neighbors, Colin and Mandy Langton, they, were, they lived five minutes away. So Colin and Mandy, our neighbors, were open to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Mandy woke up and, and knew that the Holy Spirit was, was prompting her onto the phone. Uh, just the fact that the phone call went through was a miracle. It was tough to make any kind of contact out there. But I was like sitting on the end of my bed like this and um, whispering in, into the phone that was, sit, that was it's like this far a, a, away from me. It was on the bed. And I was just like, help, please help, please help. Mandy answered, didn't hear anyone speaking. I just am in awe of, of how God laid that evening out. And he, he came back in, he walked back in at that time. And I quickly, with my, I pushed it back under the pillow. And he then came to my side of the bed. And at, by that stage, Colin and Mandy were phoning me back. And anyway, he saw and he's like, you've contacted somebody. And I said, no, no, I didn't. And I'm sure God, I always say this, God's always gracious with my little lie. <laughs> That's when he got a bit anxious. He said, I'm going to fetch more war vets. And he walked out. And now, so I'm sitting there just pretty helpless and I, I don't think 
um, people really realize how helpless you are without your, your hands. Um, and I went and I, 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 I knew I had to do something because if, if he's coming back with more people, then I, I, I couldn't be helpless. I couldn't let my family just go through more, you know. So I went and I sat next to Dave and I was busy negotiating with him, but he was in and out of consciousness and he couldn't move. And his hands were still, still tied up behind his back and I was just pleading with him to say, please, we, we need to help each other and untie our wire, the wire that was holding us. And he wasn't budging, so the next thing I had to do was the next person who could help me was my five-year-old daughter, Haley. And I went to her bedroom and I switched the light on with my shoulder. I remember that she was under her duvets. Her head was under and I said, Haley, it's mommy. And she sat up and as soon as she saw me, she started vomiting. And that was her moment face to face with evil my little girl. Anyway, I said, um, be brave, Haley. I need you to help me undo my wire. And I said, just pray. Ask Jesus to help you be brave. And she said, Jesus, please help me. Please help me to be brave. Please help me to help mommy. And she managed. She managed to undo the wires. And even days later, she would say, look, mom, I've got scratches on my fingers from the wire. I sent her to sit with Emma. That's when I went back to the room. I then undid Dave's um, hands and I just sat at the end of the bed and I remember just thinking what must I do and that's when I heard the dogs barking and so I ran through to the lounge and I saw lights car lights were in our driveway at the gate and I was like oh they've come they've come with more people and then I heard Colin Langton's voice and he was saying Dave Dave and I remember running straight through to the dining room and just banging on the window, saying, help, there's somebody in the house. And they were just running through the house trying to find him. I'm like, no, we need to see Dave. Come and see Dave. Dave needs help. And then we, I, brought, I brought them to the bedroom. And yeah, um, Colin then realized that this was serious. That's when Dave started to vomit up blood just vomiting blood everywhere and then Colin was like no we need to get him to hospital. On the trip um, Dave was traveling with Colin and Daniel into town in their car and Colin just spoke life over Dave. He was like Dave you're gonna live. I speak life over you. So it's just the power of the, of the tongue and yeah he was declaring life and I just believe that if that obviously lots of things kind of um, contributed but that was one of the things that Speaking life over Dave. Dave, you're going to live. Dave, you, you're alive. You're well. People saw, saw the situation, saw me, saw a broken body and spoke life. The prayer that, that carried us through that, that whole time, you could tangibly feel it. It was a, a phenomenal time. God, God really moved. God touched our, our lives in an amazing way. It was just amazing. Throughout that, I could feel the Lord tangibly, and even the days afterwards, I could feel Him carrying me months. Like, I, it was like I was in a bubble, and He was just taking me through the motions. And His grace could be seen in so many aspects of the night. Also, the healing of my, my girls, they, they, they're not scarred mentally from it. It's just that kind of protective glove over them and um, I also felt that the intruder, the man who was in our house, his, his actions towards me were almost held back. Something was holding him back and I just know that that's God and his angels and he is sovereign and he is victorious. There were so many things that just pointed out the grace of God. Our recovery, Dave's recovery was miraculous. Dave was in ICU for 10 days. His injuries were multiple breaks and fractures to his face. He had um, shards of skull bedded into his brain and he, he was disfigured on his face and his nose and jaw was broken, his eye socket. 
it was all just very much head injury. We didn't know how he was going to pull through. He woke up paralyzed on his right side because of his injuries to his left uh, part of the brain. And we, yeah, we weren't sure if he was ever going to walk again. In total, he was in hospital for three weeks. He actually left the hospital with a dropped foot. He was walking by that stage. He would grab things like a baby. He had to teach himself how to write again. He had lots of physiotherapy to go to, occupational therapy, and his journey was quite tough. And But just, I'm just in awe of God and how he, he carried us and, and um, protected us. For me, I, I just had a hairline fracture to my skull. My hand got very swollen and stiff and it got all hairy and just became very immobile. And just how this one finger is not fully mobile, but it's, it's there and God's just so gracious. When I called out to Jesus, it was the start of my spiritual journey and realizing, not that I didn't know before, but it, came, it became more real that we are in a spiritual battle every day of our lives. And particularly that night, there was a war ra waging over us and it just became more real to me. People often say to me, don't you just hate the man who broke into, you, into your house and tried to kill your husband and um, kind of devastate your, your life? And to be honest, I've never hated him. I've never actually wanted revenge. I would prefer him to know Jesus and to one day see him in heaven. There were so many people rallying around us, needing to catch the guys, and that's another grace point, is they were caught um, a couple of days later, and they had been a gang that had been operating for the last 10 years. They had murdered people, raped people, and just the grace of God, how it was just, you, you dealing with my child. He was like, she's mine. I have an incredible amount of peace about it. Both man and I never, um, had a burning desire or hatred or to see justice done or that was never part of our although you know that the law was going to take its course but it was never something that we pursued and naturally we would have wanted that but God gave us such a peace over that whole period it still takes me a while to to comprehend it the, the peace that we had over that period it was just awesome how God worked. It just also reminded me of a spiritual battle in that we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. We're fighting against evil spirits and principalities and rulers of the unseen world. And we're not, Satan uses people. It's not the person that we hate, it's the evil in them. And so it just was also a reminder of that we're in a spiritual battle. We don't, we, we call to love everyone. And that was, that was almost also just the sovereign grace over my life. I can't do that in my own strength. There's no ways that I could forgive somebody without that sovereign grace that God, you know, He first forgave me and so I can extend grace and, and forgiveness to, to other people. And I think that also was a huge, t like, springboard, I'd say, into my journey with, with God. I think if I was harboring hatred and unforgiveness, I don't think He could have used me. So it was almost like forgiveness set the stage for soft soil in my heart where He could be like, okay, let's deal with this. Let's, let's go on this journey together. So that, was, that is amazing. And just forgiveness is a huge part of, of healing in any situation. And um, it was actually quite a difficult time in my life at that point because it was the first time that I really needed Dave, but he wasn't around. He was in hospital for three weeks and even though God was with me, I needed Dave. And yeah, I went to court without Dave. It was, he was still in hospital. I had to, I stood face to face with the man who came in and um, beat us up. And I often speak about we're victims of grace. And that's a big part of my testimony is that we, we don't have to be victims of our circumstance and what's happening around us. No, we are, we are victims of grace and how God turns evil into good for those who love him. And it's just, it, it's almost like somebody once asked me, so are you saying 
you would do this again for what good it's brought. And I'm like, well, even though how horrific it was, how much I've learned and grown close to the Lord, yes, I wouldn't want to erase my history and because it's such a huge part of who I am and, and how the Lord has dealt with me and matured me and grow, you know, just helped with growth. I think the, the months that actually followed the attack were probably the hardest on Dave and my relationship rather than the attack. It was everything that kind of bubbled to the surface. Issues, financial issues, resentment, hurts, everything just came to the, to the foreground and it was just, yeah, and it was quite hard on us because we lost the farm um, two months later, it was taken from us and um, that I think for Dave was a huge, yeah, something, it was, his whole life was pull, pulled out from underneath him, physically and emotionally, financially, just being a man I think it must be quite difficult. <sighs> I went back to the farm, standing this time on the outside of the security fence, not being allowed in with all the tractors, all the equipment, everything locked up in, and the, the new owner saying that it was his, standing on the other side of the fence from him and just having the most amazing peace, looking at him and just saying those tractors those are not my tractors, those are God's tractors. This farm, it's not mine. Like, God let me use it for a time and my father has the cattle on a thousand hills. If, uh, if God wants me to farm again, I'll farm again. I should not be here, but here I stand today, not because of anything I did, but through God's will, God, He wants me here. He has a plan for me, and you know I'm excited for that that plan and, and that future. Yeah, and I think for our relationship, that probably was the biggest biggest hurdle. To be honest, our marriage kind of w went under um, huge strain. I think if I wasn't if I wasn't a Christian, I think yeah, divorce crossed my mind a couple of times. And I think when you go through difficult times like that, it's easy just to give up on each other and but we pushed through we went to counseling and yeah we just we've grown closer to one another yeah we've come out of it so much stronger so much closer so much um you would think that a, an attack like that or something so traumatic would bring you closer but often it 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 divides you and pushes you away and i think yeah we're different people and but one god and god's dealing with us differently and yeah it's just beautiful Dave's sister Kathy lived in Zambia at the time with her husband and her children and Jane, my mother-in-law, Dave's mum, contacted her to say you need, you need to pray, something's happened to Dave and Marianne and um, she wrote to us a couple of months after the incident with her testimony of the night and how God spoke to her and it's her testimony has become a big part of our testimony because it, it also helped with that unveiling to spiritual things and to see that we were in a spiritual battle that night, that he is victorious, that he has conquered um, evil on the cross, that he died for us and through his grace he's brought us into a relationship with him. I received a call from mom at 1.33 a.m. to say that you'd been attacked and we were being rushed into hospital by Colin and Mandy. Warwick and I prayed immediately and then I sent him back to bed where I knew he tossed and prayed for most of the night. I started praying in the spirit, put on worship music and sent urgent prayer requests out to our church leadership. I didn't know what to expect. The whole experience was a little surreal. Here was my beautiful brother and his family being rushed into hospital. It was sheer evil. But I know and trust in God. I won't lie, I did do a little pleading. I couldn't remember any scripture, I just prayed. I prayed specifically that I would be able to see in the spiritual realm because the physical was unbearable. I saw the Lion of Judah roaring over you. It was the most beautiful lion I'd ever seen, majestic and strong. To me, it was like he was telling the demonic realm to stay back and dare not go any further. In the days following, the picture remained in my head. The lion kept roaring. 
The kids and I had flown to Harare to be with you all and to help where we could. I spent whatever time I could at your bedside reading scripture over you and declaring God's goodness and praise over you. It was so hard to see you lying there, your face unrecognizable. I took so much comfort from a song called You Make Me Brave, where God calls us out beyond the shore into the waves, and that no fear can hinder the promises that God has over our lives. Around day five after your operation, I saw the lion again. Just this time, he was warding off hyenas that were biting his heels. There were many of them. It was disturbing. I rallied the troops to pray specifically for your life at this point. This lasted for around 28 hours. It was an intense time. But the Lord is faithful. He is mighty. He does not abandon his children. He is creator of all things. I truly believe that the devil was out to take your life. And if he couldn't do that, then he was going to bruise you in such a way that you would never look to Christ again. If he couldn't destroy your family by divorce and adultery, he was going to take your life, which would have been the ultimate abandonment for your little ones. A continuation of cycles that appeared to be so strong in our family line. The next picture of the lion I saw, two days later, was the same lion, resting in the shade. The lion was making quiet roars as if he had eaten his full. The lion was content. He had won the battle and there was no more threat in sight. By this time, you had pulled out your ventilator and I knew your spirit man was fighting too, even if you didn't physically know it. The morning I left, I told you that there was a spiritual battle for your life. There really was, because God has plans for our family. What my sister shared was something that God confirmed to me um, in her visions, in her um, praying in the Spirit. It just opened our eyes, spiritually opened. Yeah, we, we definitely saw life differently. The commander of heaven's armies fought for me. He fought for my family. You just can't be the same after that. God gave me a picture and it was a picture of a Granny Smith apple. It got chopped in half and I could see the, the flesh inside. And I remember seeing a picture flipping between the two halves of the apple. One was rotten and the one was beautiful and white, flesh perfect white. And I would guess it was like a, an exposing, like God was drawing out things that he wanted to deal with. Just the lie that I believed, I had believed all my life that ultimately my priority was truth, grace, love. And God was saying, uh-uh, my priority is love, grace, truth. And I always used to be very black and white. I used to say, no, this is how it is, truth, no matter how it hurt you. And so it was just a huge kind of cutting and exposing these things to me. and. Jesus didn't come to the world to condemn. He came to save. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. Jesus did not come to condemn the world. He came to save the world. And there's another scripture that says, There's no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus. He was taking me on a journey, like peeling um, old habits, just building my character, saying, No, that's not good. Let's throw that out lies, beliefs that I believed all my life. He was changing my way of thinking beliefs and there was also a, a big turning point in my life where I realized that I'd been, been believing in a powerless God. All my life I believed in God, I believed He was there, but He wasn't powerful to me. And I, it was almost like I had more faith in Satan to deceive me than in the Holy Spirit to lead me into all truth. So I remember clearly kind of brushing off the Holy Spirit because of fear that, oh, no, that's, that's something else. That's not of you. And he was breaking down my walls. He was peeling it away to say, no, it's me. Trust me more than Satan. Trust me to, to lead you into, yeah, into a new way of thinking. I had realized that I'd been stuck in law in the old covenant. When Jesus came, he was like, no, he has a new way where it's not in the, the written word, it's in the spirit. 
And it was just so beautiful how he was exposing things that I believed. Yeah, it was almost like an unveiling in my life. It was just a beautiful sight of glory to the, his mysteries, his power, just our blessings. In Ephesians, it just speaks about that we're adopted, that we belong to him, that we are seated in heavenly places with him. We are constantly in his presence. Wow, Lord, you're with me all the time. You're in me. And with that came freedom. This journey with him, getting to know him as a person, the word of God, a person, and not just written word. And it's just been, yeah, just to be able to sit in his presence, to get to know him, it feels like, like we out at dinner and it's just, we're eating together and I'm getting to know who he is, what he likes, what he doesn't like, and what he thinks about me. He loves me, I'm his daughter. Just kind of engaging in this person, not just this, God, that's far away. He then started chopping and, and boiling this apple. And that, for me, illustrates our t the tough times in our life. And like our attack, that was tough. But he turns evil into good for those who love him. And it becomes a beautiful thing. He's not doing it to punish us. He's doing it to grow us, to prune us. So this boiling and chopping, I've just felt like he's been just allowing that to happen. Dave and I got married very young and we moved into a small little cottage on the farm and we, it burned down, our house burned down in the first year of our marriage. And so straight after the incident, I just pined for security and a, and a place of my own. And he said to me, I'm your security. I'm your home. I'm your shelter. In 2 Corinthians 5, it speaks about God is preparing a place for us, a home, and, he sa and it actually says, you will not be at home until you're with me. In his presence, we get the taste of heaven. He says he's placed eternity in our hearts, and so we'll always pine for more. And it was like, more of me. That same kind of Granny Smith apple of peeling, chopping, boiling is now getting in the oven, baking it. And um, I'm like, oh no, Lord, no. I've, and then not this, not again, please, I've learned this already. And it's the heat of life just being pushed on. And, and he's like, no, I love you. You know, I love you enough. I want you beautiful and perfect like me. This is why we're doing this, to become more like God. And it's just, yeah, been a beautiful process of that. Um, and it's been a favorite, one of my favorite scriptures is 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like Him as we're changed into His glorious image. And I feel that through this journey, He's lifted this veil so that like I've, I've walked through a curtain and he's, he's become more real to me and now I see him face to face and now he's re I'm reflecting him and I want, you know, like I want to become more like him. And this process of pruning and baking and chopping and peeling, it's just this, this, this journey to something more. And I just think when we've grasped that, when we realize that Jesus is a person, when we stay in his presence every day of our lives, we can live a satisfied, abundant, powerful life. In Ephesians, it speaks about the mysteries, 
that um, he actually speaks, Paul speaks about that unveiling so that you will see the mysteries and the blessings and the power that you have at your fingertips. And not many people see that. The Holy Spirit came on Jesus without limit. It said without limit. And, and later on in John, in John it's, Jesus said, go and you will do greater things than me. And it just reminded me that part of my life I've put God in a box. That he's been powerless you just stay right there how I like it. And he's kind of burst that box open and he said, no, I'm, I'm powerful without limit. And you, I'm living in you. He says, I'm in you. So your life should be limitless, powerful, extravagant. And I just, that's another thing I've realized about God is he's extravagant. He made the world. He made all the beautiful things. I can't have this mentality of, no, less, less. You know, God, God is, He wants more. He wants to bless. That's his, his heart. And so we can't put Him in this little box. We need to be becoming more like Him, not Him becoming more like us. And pulling the, the, the dish out of the oven, and He adds His final touches on things like just the drizzling of syrup on the, on the pudding, and He's like, this is, this is perfect. This is now me, you, together and it's like it's a beautiful thing just presenting this beautiful pudding that's come from just something very small but he's worked on and he's added his bits and he's taken away and it's us together and he's presented this beautiful pudding to to people and it's a feast now he's like family this is what it's all about come come and taste and see that the lord is good taste and come and feast on what i'm doing and I, I just think it's such a beautiful picture of family because that's what it's all about, family. Him being our dad and us being his kids.